Uh, I am Matthew Senrich. <laughs> and I'm Keegan Michael Key. So we've been hearing about you. No. Uh. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And oh. my mother loves you. <laughs> oh, 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 we'll tell your mom I love her. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't let her come. I've got a good feeling. <laughs> he, he didn't let her come. He didn't yeah. let her come. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so we were talking about the experience in the booth. And then we're hearing about the uh, co-creators directing you. How are they to be directed by them in the booth? It's a, it's the thing is it's a wholly collaborative experience. That's the thing is is uh, I just found out literally today. I found out at, sitting at that table over there <laughs> that while they let me run off at the mouth for twenty minutes, they're rewriting the script. <laughs> and so which I didn't know. I mean, this yeah. is really funny to me yeah. that, that I that not funny, haha, funny like oh okay. So then I can spend even more time just yeah. saying whatever I want to say. It, I think what one of the loveliest things about Zev and Matt is that they're, they're devoid of ego. It's just what's best for Supermansion, what's best for Supermansion. And I feel like when that happens, good work comes out of it, special work comes out of it, magic work comes out of it. It's interesting, it's how we've always run, we always ran things at Key and Peele. The show is above anybody's personal crap or feelings about my sketch should be in. It's always about the show. And um, they're, they're a dream to work with. It's, it's kind of why I wanted to do this show. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's the artistic process that we're going through together that's so glorious. I don't know, you just, I, again, you know, coming from the robot chicken world, the first thing that Seth taught me, you know, is not to say louder and faster in a, in a voice booth to an actor. And, uh, you know, they want to find the heart of these characters and play in that role. And, uh, you know, it, it's, Again, I was not an actor in any way, and having a partner that is, you learn a lot about that process and what people like and what they don't. And him having I've done a ton of voiceover, that's kind of where I learned it all, which is great. You, yeah, uh, to uh, Mr. Key. Um, so you've worked both in front of the camera now and also as a voice actor. Which one do you feel artistically gives you the most range to work with? Well, the, mo the most freedom that you can have, the most freedom you can have is to be able to use every single part of your instrument. But in regard to being able to go up to the line all the time, it's going to be the voice acting. Because you have to inhabit a character that's beyond human. I mean, we're all watching the show, so we, you've, you've signed a contract to say, I'm going to believe that these small figurines are have superpowers, <laughs> and they're also small figurines. So there's something beyond our experience of humans. So, so not, that, not that the show is devoid of nuance, it's just that I am given the opportunity to go as far as I want. Um, uh, I, I don't think you have ever, ever given me the note, hold it back, or give us less. Yeah. I don't think I've ever gotten that note once. Um, but also, you've encouraged me to give you something different, something new, so that any given line can have seven different colors to it. So uh, there's something more um, liberating almost about being in the booth. And what's helpful is knowing what the characters look like, knowing what their powers are, knowing how um, supernatural this world is. I got some separate <laughs> questions. One for uh, you get um, American Ranger and Sergeant Agony. How do you keep them separate? Is it the direction? Is it the writing? Um, is it like just for you uh, as an actor? Um, uh, what what do you do in thought process wise so that you don't confuse the two and mix the two? Well, I, I, I you know I made a conscious decision of making. The voices, the voices is completely opposite from each other as they could possibly be, and also that has to do with the writing. That wasn't a hard task. <laughs> um, uh, these guys have really done a great job at defining exactly what everybody's motivations for existing are, and so that that made it easier. Just, I mean, it's really mostly the voices being completely, completely different, so that even if I'm talking to myself, I can keep them distinct. And then, in regard to where they're coming from uh, as characters. There's always a sense of, um, you just look at the stories and look at the text, and it gives you so much information. Like, American Ranger is literally trying to get a foothold in the world it's in. And Sergeant Agony is, a, is uh, everything's very myopic for him. His world is one thing, it's stopping this group from existing, and, 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 and stopping their, all their fiduciary malfeasance, <laughs> as, as he sees it. So, um, these guys have written really defined characters, and it's been even easier to do in the second season. And actually, there are scenes, they're both kind of pining after the same person. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And the there's, there's, season, yeah. there are scenes where they're going to be competing against each other, and you have to make them, uh, you know, really sound distinct. And yeah. That's what, that, and you notice in that moment, that's what pops. You can just hear it. What about uh, 
the superhero genre. Yeah. <laughs> Girls you typically face obviously you worked on Robot Chicken. Uh, are you a fan of superheroes or was it? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, I, I, my first job was at Marvel Comics. I was an intern in high school and I worked in comics all through my life. I, you know, I was, I was working at Wizard Magazine, like the whole shebang. Really? And, uh, yeah, I was the editorial director for eight years. Take that in. <laughs> I just did a 25th in that incarnation. I didn't really yeah. Yep, I was at the panel and doing that anniversary and everything. Um, but yeah, it was a you know again for me, I'm I'm a huge comic geek and I like playing with toys and that's where Robot Chicken started from and that's where I met Seth to start it all. He was a fan of the magazine and he was a fanboy on me, um, and that's where we be, you know he was like one day he just called me up and he's like, hey, I was thinking about doing a little animated short with my my toy. And all because of a sudden, Wizard used to do that magazine. They would put, yes. the, put the blurb with the, the, the little toys the over there. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, Twisted Toy Fair Theater. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, big geek. And uh, that's kind of where this whole thing is. And Zeb, Zeb, just to give you backstory, uh, I met him because through Wizard Magazine, he entered our video contest when he was a 20 year old kid in Colorado. And I was like, this kid's funny. <laughs> and, uh, and so I ended up uh, having him win. He ended up getting uh, some jobs in, in Marvel from that. And then when we were starting up Robot Chicken, I was like, I'm going to bring this kid and have him do Robot Chicken with me. And uh, we lured him to, to do that. And then ever since then, you know, one time we were talking about the comic world, how we were big geeks. <laughs> we're like, we should do a show like this. And we just started bantering back and forth what this thing could be, writing things, sending him back and forth. And it just turned into this show. And, and you with superheroes? What's that? You with superheroes? He hates them. Yes, no. <laughs> I like superheroes. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm not at the level of expertise as him or Zeb. I mean, they are masters in this regard. But I, I, I did collect comics a lot of, uh, in, in high school and a little bit into college. So I, I'm a. I'm, I'm more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. And um, but that's me. That's just me. You know what I mean? Um, um, so yeah, they're, they're, I have an affinity for superheroes, and also the fact that they're building the lore is what's attractive to me. So I, I mean, I like. I like the satirical aspect of it. But them building and manufacturing their own lore for these characters, that's so fun. Yeah. Um, how do I feel about working at it in, in, in regard to the talk about inclusion? Yeah, working doing this particular show. Well, it's it's fun. It's it's fun because I get to play two different characters that are two different races as well, which is which is interesting. And and um, I've been I. I've been learning more and more that, and I try to encourage younger people, and younger people of color, these things are amazing because we can make movies on them, which means that you can tell your story the way you want to tell it. And, and people need to hear those stories, you know. At the end of the day, the most important thing is that they're, just, is that they're human stories. Everybody wants, everyone's afraid of looking silly, everyone um, wants to feel secure, it doesn't matter how much melanin you have in your skin or not. And, and, and so, there is an inclusion, I, I mean, I try to make sure that the stories are all human, but are also being told from a particular point of view, so that everybody can identify. That's something that's important. Going off of uh, what yeah. you said about uh, collecting comics, um, you recently discussed in the Nerds podcast that you had found uh, that you were related half-brother to Dwayne McDuffie. Yes. Since then, have you uh, gone back and read any of his material? I have not know that. Uh, did you not know that? I did not know that. Yes. Yeah, just inside story. In Long Island, I live out there now. He did a very small but very long convention icon. Uh -huh. He was at a table, me and my best friend were walking. The floor was empty. We went to the table. Uh, Dwayne McDuffie was just sitting by himself. Nobody was there. I bought the... Uh, the icon trade from him. It was out of print. DC didn't print it. Uh, and he was just alone. I'm like, you're one of the giants of the industry. You've written for uh, the Justice League cartoon and Static yeah. and all that. Yeah. Co-creator of all that stuff. And he told us that um, uh, DC would not make a poster. They wouldn't make uh, a doll. They wouldn't make a t-shirt for Static, even though Static was the number one TV show for children on, on, on networks. But... Soon after we met him, he went uh, to get uh, surgery. He passed away. He passed away. Literally, like after he his died birthday. In wow. Yeah. Complications like, in the surgery. Uh, yeah. Was, for heart surgery. Yeah. yeah. We were heart. We were like, oh my god, we just met him. Yeah. yeah. So, so to find out about that connection after the fact, how does that affect you? Well, it's. Uh, I, 
you know, I, I didn't know him, and because because my life, the comic books had a big part of my life in high school, but then once I discovered theater in the way that I discovered it, everything else went away. Everything but but what I saw my life, what I wanted my life to be. So I'm not I'm not as familiar with his work, and now, uh, it's kind of funny, it, if, when the sun is shining, you gotta make hay. So I don't have a ton of time to watch as much television as I'd like to watch and read as oh, much yeah. as books as I like. I have to carve out that time. But that's a very good thing to do <laughs> in the very near future <laughs> since my half brother changed the world of comics. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I didn't even know. Yeah. Matt, yeah. For, for all the craziness in the show, there's like a real like strong line of humanity that goes through the first season, especially it seems surrounding Brad a lot and a lot of his trouble. Is that something that, you know, you consciously kind of try to work in without being like an athlete special about it? Yeah, I mean, the, when we started the season, Zeb and I actually uh, put all the characters' names on the board and we needed to know what their emotional arc was going to be, um, which I think in a lot of animated shows they don't do. And it was really trying to find that balance a little bit because we wanted to be very over the top. We wanted to be funny first, but we really did need, again, we wanted to put heart into it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we want long lasting effects on people, and I don't think uh, animated shows do that very often. Um, you know, I think, I think we even deal with it in the first uh, episode of the new season. Uh, you're going to see, you know, the characters have to grasp the concept of, of death and, uh, and understand it. But at the same time, the funny spin on death, which is a really hard thing to do, but it is something that you have to do to get over certain things. And um, again, I think it's just a different perspective that people will put uh, onto it. I don't think shows do it. It's always the dark. Um, and, and, you know, the main conversation we always have is trying to bring the light. So. Was it a little bit of a challenge in season two with the loss of Brad, who I felt like was kind of like the emotional core a little bit of the team, to keep putting that humanity in? Yes. Yes. It, it, it was and it is, but, and I'll leave it with a but, you'll kind of see where it's going to end up. Like, we're, we're dealing with new relationships, you know, it's the friendship between Black Saturn and the Groner of a hero and a villain who actually like each other but then don't think they should talk to each other and how that puts them in that awkward scenario of can you be friends with someone who are in two different social spheres um, you know it's uh, you know having to come to grasps uh, and you know what happens with you know Cooch having to figure out how to deal with her life in some way um, it's I mean, the main story, it's really looking at uh, Titanium Rex and his family uh, and what's going to happen with his family. And it's trying to figure the, that sort of stuff out. Are you going to get Obama into the show? Are you going to call him up and get a no? Yeah, I don't know. Do you want to do that? <laughs> he's going to have some free time. Yeah. He's going to have some free time. time. He's got to do a little different, right? He's got to sell. I can yeah. just call him. Yeah. Call him on the I, 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 I could just do him. <laughs> 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 before you go. 